right, well, you guys can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you for that introduction and for honoring me that way. Worship team, you guys can have a seat as well. Can we give it up, we give it up for our worship team? They did an amazing job. As always for us this morning, man, I'm so thankful every single week to come up here and preach after having that experience in worship. Man, that's so incredible. Well, welcome everybody, as Corey said, to the very first Sunday in 2018. Man, I am so excited for this year and what God is going to do in this place. But before I actually get to actually casting some vision for the year, I just want to take just a few minutes and kind of look back and see what God did in and through us and this church in 2017. And I think it's very important for us to do this. As a matter of fact, uh, a couple places in Scripture that I can immediately go to, one in the Old Testament is whenever the Israelites, they were uh, coming out of slavery in Egypt, right? They were led by Moses. They had to wander the wilderness for 40 years. They finally get to go into the promised land, but there is a barrier. It's the Jordan River. But God is going to do to the Jordan River what he did to the Red Sea, and he parts it, and millions of people, the Israelites, walk across on dry land. But this time, Joshua, who's leading them at this time, does something a little different. He actually orders the priest to get 12 large stones up out of the river, and he sets them together in a big pile, and he does it for a very important reason. He says, look, whenever your children, whenever your descendants, your grandchildren ask what these stones mean, you can tell them that God brought us through on dry land, right? It was something to remember. It was a marker to look back to. And then if we go to the New Testament, there are 10 lepers who have this disease and they come to Jesus and Jesus heals them a little bit different. He actually says, why don't you go show yourself to the priest? And it says that as they were walking, they began to be healed. Well, only one of them recognized that he was being healed. And so he immediately turned back to Jesus. He fell at Jesus' feet and scripture says that he thanked him. It also says that Jesus says this, this is word for word. Jesus says, were not 10 healed? Where are the other nine? It's almost like Jesus just assumes that as he begins to do things in our life, as we begin to see him work, our immediate uh, uh, response should just be to, to thank him, right? To give, to give him thanks, to be grateful for everything that he's doing in our life. And that is exactly what I want to do just for the next few minutes. I actually want to look back uh, at 2017 and kind of give you five highlights as I saw God work in and through this church. Now, I want to also say that this isn't everything that God did. There are hundreds, if not thousands of things that God did in this church in 2017. I heard countless testimonies, and I can't stand up here and just share them all, but here's what I can share. Here's kind of an aerial view. The first thing that I'm thankful for is our Live It initiative. Our Live It initiative, we got to actually do it the entire year of 2017. It's the first Saturday of every month. We give up two hours serving our community. And so that, over a course of a time, if just one person served, that's 24 hours, but I ran the numbers. Guys, we had over 500 hours spent serving this community in 2017. Man, that's awesome. We got to partner with incredible ministries. We got to serve alongside some amazing people and really make a difference in this community for the name of Jesus. The second thing um, that I have on my list is this. We actually, in 2017, we had... Uh, 26 people attend our uh, Next Steps class where they heard about uh, what it takes to be an owner here at Cornerstone Church, and all 26 people decided that they want to actually make the step to have this be their church. We actually grew also by over 16% in 2017, and Easter 2017, we actually set a single-service attendance record with 407 people in attendance, and I'm super excited about that and the growth that we've experienced because it is an opportunity for us to reach more people, to share the good news, and to see people come to Christ. It's an incredible, incredible thing that I think we got to take part of uh, in 2017. And also, the reason why I'm excited about that is studies will tell you that 75% of churches in America have plateaued or are in decline. But we've seen God bring just such an incredible increase to our family and our body here, and I'm excited about that. The third thing I'm excited about, and, and this honestly is going to blow some of you uh, away, um, you hear it every week whenever we do our offering devotions that we truly want to look to invest into ministries, to invest into the kingdom, uh, not only locally but all over the world. And we actually 
don't just say that. We actually back it up. In, in 2017, we actually, and I'm not going to say gave away. I'm going to say invested instead. We actually invested or sold, get this. I can't believe I'm going to say this number. $101,530 into kingdom ministries and missions all over the world. Are you kidding me? That is, that is incredible. And you can hear a number like that and you can give some applause. But let me actually tell you a couple stories of some people in some countries that that money is impacting. One of the people that we partner with, his name is J.T. Norman. And J.T., along with his wife, Elizabeth, actually run an orphanage and a Bible school in India. And we not only support them on a monthly basis, we actually also over the summer collected a donation and we sent $17,000 to JT so that he could buy a new bus. Can we just show that picture of the bus up on the screen? So there's JT on the right with his Bible in his hand and they're kind of praying over this bus. And he actually just sent me an email uh, a couple of weeks ago and he said, you know, I'm so thankful for Cornerstone and the gifts that you guys continue to send our way. I thank you for the money that you sent for us to be able to purchase this bus. He said, I got to actually be honest, the old bus that we had, I had kind of a poverty mentality with it because we all gathered around it, we laid hands on it, and we actually prayed that that bus would be like the sandals on the Israelites' feet. You see, those sandals, as they wandered the wilderness for 40 years, it, the scripture tells us they never wore out. But God didn't answer that prayer for JT. Their bus did wear out, and it did, you know, crash, die, and was no longer uh, able to be used. And he said whenever he got the blessing of our new bus, he realized um, he was praying the wrong way. Instead of praying that something might not be worn out, he said, I'm going to pray that that this bus will actually make an incredible impact, a bigger impact. And he said, the bus that we got from you guys is bigger, it's nicer, it's more attractive, it's able to not have to be worked on every single week. And it actually is making a huge difference in their ministry every single day. And guess what? We get to be a part of that. Matter of fact, get this, he actually sent me an email uh, last week to kind of close out the year. He said from their ministry there at the orphanage, plus the 380 Bible students that they have raised up and sent out as pastors, they have seen 26,130 people come to Christ this year in India. And again, that is also possible because of you and your generosity. Another story I want to tell you uh, is the story of, um, of a man named uh, Pastor Alex. Pastor Alex and his wife, Emma, uh, have a large um, church actually in the nation of the Philippines. And uh, Pastor Alex uh, has multiple uh, campuses across the entire island, and they are actually reaching thousands of people every single week for Christ. But he sent me this story just this week. So the nation of the Philippines, all the islands, they are experiencing devastating flooding at this time. Uh, people are losing their lives, losing their homes. I mean, it is catastrophic. But he sent me this story, and I'm going to be honest, this story moved me to tears when I was reading it this week. He said there was a village, and the floodwaters were coming. And not only were there floodwaters coming, these floodwaters were actually carrying with it these three to, foot, uh, three to four foot wide boulders uh, in it. And so it was destroying houses, villages along its path. Well, some members in the church in that uh, city where he has a church plant, they got together in one of the homes and the waters begin to come, and they actually just got out of the guitar, and they begin to sing praises to Jesus. They begin to cry out to God. They begin to pray, and all of a sudden, all these trees just collapsed over their house. They thought they were going to die. They thought this was it, but the trees actually formed this cocoon, so when the rocks actually came, it actually parted, and it did not kill them in the house. I'm telling you right now, this is important because hundreds of people lost their lives in this flood. Houses all around them were completely devastated. Matter of fact, you can hear this uh, story again and think, well, that's a great story. But when I put a picture to it, you're going to like be like, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe the goodness of God. Can we pull up that picture? This is actually where the village stood. And there in the very, very back, if you see that pile of trees, there's another picture that actually zooms in a little bit more. And these trees just formed a, a complete cocoon around the house. So all these stones didn't get to the people in the house that were praising God. 
Man, I'm thinking right away of Paul and Silas in that jail cell, right? They were locked up. They were captive. But they, get, they began to praise, and they began to pray, and their chains fell off. I'm telling you right now, we serve a God who is a miracle-working God, and he still works today. Can we give thanks for God for that? Man, but we're a part of that. We're a part of that as we are generous people. The fourth thing that we actually got to experience in 2017 as a church body, we actually got to celebrate with 28 people who identified with Christ, who followed his, uh, his example uh, in baptism. And that's incredible. 28 people, which actually leads me to one of the most exciting things that we got, we got to see here in this place. Guys, from our services that we do, from our camps, from just people just being a light in the world, from our student ministries to our children's ministry. In 2017, we actually got to see 40 people receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Come on, that is incredible. That is incredible. 25% of churches did not see one last year. And God continues to, to bring increase. God continues to show his goodness and his favor and his faithfulness as we continue to do what he asked us and what he has called us to do. Man, 2017, church, was an incredible year, but I'm believing that 2018 is going to be even better. You know, it, it's like this. You know, when, when you're driving a car, the rearview mirror is important. And it's, and it's important to be able to look back, but the windshield is so much bigger because it's so much more important about, to think about where you're going, to think about where you're headed and where are we headed in 2018. Well, every single year, uh, I kind of get a little bit of a, of a word for our church, and, and this isn't something that, um, that I think sets the ultimate tone for where we're going, but it's just kind of a theme for us to follow. It's like a guide that we get to kind of um, hone in on and kind of just see how God is going to move in our body. And, and uh, a couple years ago, the word was uncharted, and we did face a lot of uncharted, unexpected things. Last year was the word acceleration, and I began to just see that God was preparing us and accelerating us for just incredible things. But this year, um, here's the word that I got for 2018. And if you're taking notes, I, I really encourage you to write not only this word down, but what I have to go along with this word down, because I think that this is going to be something that we're going to continue to come back to week after week, month after month, throughout 2018, and here it is, the word for the year is focus, focus. Now, I got this word months ago, and I began to just pray this, uh, this thing out and say, God, focus, that seems very vague. Like, I can't just get up there and say the word for the year is focus. They're going to be like, okay, yeah, Shannon, we always have to focus in life. But as I began to pray through this, and I, as I began to just see God, I, I began to see that there is a process that God wants to take us through that completely identifies to focusing on something. It follows a pattern. And here's what I mean. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. Focus, the first thing focus does is it initiates change. Think about it. If you have a lot of things going on in your life, if you want to, you know, try to tackle a multiple, uh, multiple things, you can't really get all of them done. But if you begin to say, this is what I want to focus on, it, it initiates the change in your life. You can't be looking here, 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 but you begin to just focus and hone in on one thing. And as you make the change, the second thing that focus does is this. Focus actually brings clarity. It brings clarity. Think about looking through a pair of binoculars, right? You actually kind of get a direction you want to look. You put the binoculars up, and then you kind of adjust it, and you focus in on it. And it brings clarity to whatever you're looking at. So whatever's in front of us, as we begin to focus on it, clarity comes. And once we, once we get what we're, uh, what we're focusing in on, once we get that clarity, once we make the change, the third thing that focus does is this. Focus takes commitment. Okay, I see what it is I want to walk towards, and as I continue to focus in on it, as I continue to walk towards it, it takes commitment to stay the course. The fourth thing focus does is this. Focus increases your courage. As you're walking it out, as you're committed to something, it increases the courage in your life to continue on towards what it is you're focused on. It increases your courage. And then the fifth thing, this is just a process. I'm going through this quickly. Focus decreases chaos. 
whenever you're focused in on something, you're headed towards it, you're clear about this is what, about the vision that you have, when, you, when you're committed to it, and as courage increases, if something's increasing in your life, then something has to decrease. And I promise you, as you begin to take steps towards that which God has called you to do, as you're focused on it, the chaos in your life begins to decrease. Okay, so that was just really quick. So let me kind of just share two stories on how this process might play out in your life. So first off, person, a personal story. So a couple of years ago, I was, um, I was not feeling right in how I was actually parenting my boys. I have four boys, and I want to make sure that I am the best dad that I can be. I want to make sure that I am training them up in how I am supposed to be so that they can become the men that God has called them to be. And, and I went to Mel, and I said, Mel, I don't know if I'm doing this right. There's so many things I can be doing. I'm not exactly sure what I should be doing. I don't know where where. where where, where we're supposed to be with this parenting thing. I was very anxious. I was very ner- nervous in my parenting style. And she said, well let's, well, let's focus in on something. What exactly is it that, that we need to do? So it started to change in our life, right? So then we began to just write out things that we want to see in our boys, some, some traits that we would like them to have. And as we began to get this plan, it became very clear what we're supposed to do. And so we came up with this Bandit Family Code. You've heard me talk about this before. All that is is just an acronym for B-A-N-E-T, our family name, and it's be where your feet are, always show respect, never give up, everyone contribute something, and think positive. And I said, that's the plan, and we're going to stick to it. And as we made the commitment to just continue to go over these things with our boys, to, to train them up in these five areas, yeah, there's a lot of things we can be doing, and a lot of things are good, but this is what we're focused on. We're not going to try to do 100 things. We're going to do these five things, and we're going to try to train them up very well in these five areas of life. And as we made that commitment, man, our courage in how we parented began to just increase. Matter of fact, I saw the kids' anxiety level go down, and I saw them like a couple months ago. Isaac is like, Malachi, come on. Everybody contribute something. We got to go unload the dishwasher. And I'm like, yes. They're getting it. It's finally being, you know, ingrained in, in their lifestyle. And I'm telling you, once we began to just continue to walk these things out, the chaos in our house drastically went from here to here. It decreased. It's a process as we begin to focus on what it is that God wants us to be focused on. It's a process that God takes us through. And then I was thinking the second story is a story actually from Scripture. It's the story of uh, a guy named Bartimaeus. Now, Bartimaeus was blind. And so he actually had heard that Jesus was coming his way, and so he initiated a change. He said, when Jesus comes, I'm not just going to sit here and beg. I'm actually going to cry out, and I'm going to yell out for Jesus to have mercy on me. And that's exactly what he did. And he was clear with his vision. He, he, He couldn't actually see, but the vision he had for his life was to see. So he said, look, I can't see, but I have, I, I have a, a voice that I can use. And so he began to cry out, and he was committed to it. He was committed to it so much so that people told him to be quiet. Look, you're making too much noise. Jesus doesn't want to have anything to do with you. But it says as he was being deterred like that, that he actually cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Because he was focused on getting his healing. And he wasn't going to let anybody stop. His, his courage was increased because of his focus. Jesus came over, took note of that. He actually laid his hands on him, and the guy actually got healed. And I don't know about you, but a blind guy gets healed, I guarantee you the chaos in his life decreases drastically. See, it's this process that God takes us through as we focus in on what it is that he has for us. And I said all that to say this. In 2018, what I feel that God wants us as a church to focus on more than anything is the people that we need to reach the people that we need to reach. I want you to think about even our purpose statement as a church. You know, we say it all the time, but we exist to help people in the process of progress from wherever they are to wherever God is leading. That's why we exist. That's what we do. We exist to help people in the process of progress. And yes, the process is important. Yes, seeing progress in people's life, that's important. We want to know that people are progressing and not just staying the same. But the most important aspect of our purpose statement is we exist to help people. People are what matter to God, and since people matter to God, people should matter to us. 
You know, I like how one church puts it, Life Church out in Oklahoma, their mission statement is this, we'll do anything short of sin to reach people who are far from Christ. I love that. We'll do anything short of sin to reach people who are far from Christ. Meaning to reach the people no one is reaching, we need to do things that no one is doing. And I just believe in 2018, we're actually going to step into some new areas. We're going to begin to take some risks, and we're going to actually see God come through as we do it. One of the things that really has been on uh, my heart and really the leadership's heart of this church is to actually plant an extension campus. Not a whole new campus where we're going to ask a lot of you to leave and go start something somewhere else. We actually want to start an extension of what we already have on a different night of the week, hopefully in an urban area that we can have access to people so that we can just share the goodness of God to as many people as we can. But here's where I need your help. We need clarity on where we need to plant. I'm going to be honest. We know we want it in an urban area. We don't know if we want like downtown New Albany, Jeffersonville, Louisville. We're just really not sure on that aspect. But I'm telling you, as soon as we have the place, we're ready to go. And so I'm going to actually ask you uh, to join with me. You know, I've been praying about this for a long time. I actually began fasting about this very thing this year, and I'm going to continue to fast. I'm going to ask you if you would please join me in praying and even fasting for this, because I really think that in 2018, this is exactly what God has for Cornerstone, for us to launch out, to branch out, so that we can reach people who are far from Christ, so that they can experience life in Him. Guys, here's the deal. Found people, find people, and bring them to Jesus. And if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not a secret that you should keep to yourself. It's something that, we should, that should compel us to go out and bring other people in to experience the same life that we have in Jesus. Found people, find people, save people, serve people. So we're going to look for a place to plant. Another thing we're going to do as we look to reach as many people as possible, we really want a continual pursuit of the Spirit to see the Spirit move like never before. Because we recognize that it is the Spirit's work that draws people to Christ. We recognize that whenever the Spirit shows up and the Spirit begins to move, and as we see signs and wonders and miracles take place, that people take note of that. And the the greatest miracle that can take place is someone receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I'm telling you right now, as we begin to continue to pursue the Spirit, and as we begin to have these uh, places that we want to plan, as we begin to reach out, I promise you that the need is there for us to step up in an even more incredible way than we have so that we can make an impact right here, not only in Floyd, now, Floyd Knobs, but this, just the surrounding area. Guys, it's the people that we need to reach. That's, that, that's what it is. That's, that's, our, that's our heart. That's my heart as, as the pastor of this church, that that is going to be the focus of 2018. But what about you? What about you individually? That's us corporately, but, but what would you want to focus on in 2018 for you? I'm just curious, how many of you here uh, actually set some New Year's resolutions this year? Anybody set New Year's res- resolutions? Man, Not very many of you. Well, that's good, though, because hopefully today, by the end of this thing, you're actually going to take home something that is going to be different in your life in 2018. Here's the deal. I'm glad that not very many of you have resolutions because uh, studies show by the end of January, 40% of you all that do have resolutions have already given up on them. And by Valentine's Day, 75% of you are no longer doing what you resolve to do. So, hey, it's good that you don't have one. So maybe we can start one today. And, uh, and maybe it's not just going to be a resolution, because resolutions tend to just be good intentions. But my hope is that you leave today with a God intention. One thing that you're centered on, one God-centered thing in your life that wants to be different. And the reason why I keep saying one thing, because I know if you actually have like, you know, 10 things you're going to do, 10 things you're going to focus on, chances are you're not going to do any of them. But if you can just have one thing in your life that's different, I promise you that after time, you know, after five years of just focusing on one thing a year, your life will be drastically different because at the end of five years, five things will be different, and that's a completely different life. So what I'm going to do today, I'm actually going to ask you uh, four one-thing questions to get you thinking on what it is that you need to be focused on 
in 2018? What one thing do you actually need to hear from God? What one thing do you actually need to make different in your life so that, so that you can have the greatest impact in 2018? And, and this is kind of going to be kind of cool, uh, but also impactful, because what we're going to do is look at four uh, scriptures uh, in the Bible that actually have the phrase, one thing in it. And hopefully, as we unpack these questions, you're actually going to um, take with you uh, that one thing for you and in your life. So here we go. The first question I have for you is this. What one thing do you desire from God? If God were to do one thing for you, what would it be? And let me ask you this. If God actually said yes to one of your prayers this year, would anybody else's life look different? What one thing do you desire from God? David, David was a guy uh, who said, the scripture says he was a man after God's own heart, and he did all kinds of incredible things, but there was one thing that he desired more than anything else. Psalms actually 27 verse 4 tells us this. Check this out. One thing, everybody say one thing. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Man, David says, the one thing that I desire more than anything is just to be in the presence of God. And you know that we have it so much better than David had it? David said, I gotta go to the temple to experience God. But now that Jesus has come, when he left, he actually sent his spirit, and now we have God's presence with us every single place that we go. But that might be your one thing, maybe to experience and to to be more aware of the presence of God in your life. Maybe for some of you, you do recognize there is someone uh, in your life, maybe a family or a friend that you know needs Jesus. And maybe this year your prayer is, God, would you please use me to love them in such a way that they want a relationship with you? Maybe for others of you, maybe, maybe this is the year you want to break some stronghold or some addiction off your life. You're tired of going around the mountain. Yeah, you, you, you do good for a little while, but then you go right back to it. You quit. You do good for a while. You go right back to it. Maybe this is the year you want to break that cycle, and so your prayer would be, God, would you just help me by the power of your spirit to break this addiction or this stronghold off of my life for good in 2018? Maybe for some of you uh, that, um, that have relationships that, that are that are not good right now. Maybe it's a marriage relationship and, and you and your spouse, you're, you're at each other. Maybe your one thing this year is, is for God to help you uh, get and sustain a strong, healthy marriage. Where your one thing isn't to ask God to maybe change someone else, to change your spouse, but your one thing, your one desire is that God would begin to change you in such a way that your spouse takes note. What one thing, what is the one thing that you desire for God, from God? Think about it. The second thing is this. The second question I'm going to ask you is this. I, I encourage you to take notes and write, continue to write this stuff down. What one thing do you lack? Is there anything that, that you're missing in life? Jesus was uh, approached by a guy. We don't know his name. He was just called the rich young ruler. So we know he had a lot of stuff. He was wealthy. Um, he comes to him and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus uh, looks at him and he says, you know what, keep the commandments. This guy's like, oh, I've done all that. You know, honor your mother and death, father, I, I've done all that. I, I've kept them all. What else do I still lack? And then Jesus actually looks at him and says this in Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I want you to take note, note of that. Jesus loved him. He's about ready to tell him something very difficult, but he does it in love. He says one thing, everybody say one thing. Man, you all are dead today. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This is what you lack. You're letting your stuff get in the way of a relationship maybe lived with me. That's the one thing that you lack. Man, this guy wanted eternal life. He wanted the abundant life. Jesus is telling him what he's lacking from receiving it. But check this out, verse 22, it says this. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He wasn't willing to do what God had called him to do. What is it that you're missing 
What is it that you are actually lacking in your life? The third thing I would ask you is this. What one thing do you need to let go of? What one thing do you need to let go of? The Apostle Paul, he was writing in uh, Philippians chapter 3, and he's like, I want to know Christ, not just know about him, but I want to know him. I want to know him personally. I want to know the power of his suffering. And then he goes on to say this in verse 13. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Everybody say one thing. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straying towards what is ahead. I, it's like this, this single motion. I can just see it. He's letting go of what's behind him, and he's pressing on to what God has for him. This one thing I do, I let it go, and I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, now what was it that held Paul back? What, what did Paul need to let go of? You know, Scripture really never tells us exactly what that was. Now, we can speculate a little bit, you know, because before Paul was Paul, he was Saul, and Saul actually persecuted the church. Matter of fact, it was Saul who probably gave the order to actually have Stephen killed, the very first Christian martyr. Maybe that was weighing on him. Maybe he felt some guilt and he needed to let that go. Matter of fact, he had put countless people in prison. He had actually ordered uh, other death sentences upon Christians. Like, there are so many things that that Paul had did in his life, he was probably facing some guilt, and he maybe just needed to let that go. Maybe it was the things that he actually had to go through because of Christ. He was shipwrecked. He was uh, beaten and left for dead. He was uh, stoned to death. Uh, man, he was beaten and whipped. I mean, so many things that Paul had to endure from his faith. Maybe he's like, I, I got to let all that go. I can't let that stop me. I got to let it go, and I got to press on towards the prize for which God called me heavenward. I don't know what it is in your life, but maybe 2018 is the year you guys let some things go. Maybe you've been harboring bitterness. Maybe there's some unforgiveness in your life, and I'm telling you, the only people uh, or the only person that that is affecting is you. Maybe it's time to let it go. I'm not saying pretend like it never happened. I'm just saying with the power of God, begin to release it so that it doesn't affect you to not be um, uh, as capable uh, and, and as impactful in the kingdom as you can be. Begin to let that thing go. What is it that you need to let go of? And then the fourth thing is this. What one thing do you need to claim as a promise from God? What one thing do you need to claim as a promise from God? In the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories is whenever uh, Nathan, he actually goes to this dude Jesse's house because he is looking to anoint the next king of Israel. And so he has Jesse line up uh, his sons in front of him. And he kind of goes down the line, nope, you got strong, but no, he's not it, not, Handsome, but no, he's not the king. I, oh, he's intelligent, but no. He just goes down the line, continues down, and he says, none of these are the king. Are you sure you don't have another son? He's like, well, I have the run. He's, he's out tending sheep. His name's David. He's like, well, call David in. David comes in, and immediately Nathan knows that this is to be the king. So he anoints him on the spot and tells him, you are going to be the next king of Israel. That's the promise that he got from God. But sometimes the promise takes a while to play out. And every time David took maybe one step forward, he took like three steps back, three steps back. Yeah, he defeated Goliath. But then he had to go and, and play for King Saul so that demons would leave him. Yeah, he did some amazing things on the battlefield. But then Saul got jealous and actually sought to kill David, to take him out. Matter of fact, uh, he, he was uh, one time on the run for his life from King Saul, and he comes up with this, what he thinks is a brilliant idea to go hang, hang out and hide with the Philistines, their enemy, because surely Saul won't look for me there. But when he gets there, he's like, I made a mistake. This is a stupid idea. And so what he does is like, i got to pretend to be a madman so they don't know who I am. And so he's like, ah, I don't know, that's the best madman I got. 
he pretends to be this crazy person so they, they, they don't discover who he is. And he's in this place, and he's like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm in the enemy's camp. King Saul's after me. I'm supposed to be king. That's the promise I got, but I don't feel like I'm king. And he actually writes these words in Psalm chapter 56, starting in verse 9. He says this, my enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. This I know. Basically, this one thing that I know, God is on my side. God is on my side. Verse 10, I praise God for what he has promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. Man, this I know, this one thing I know, God is on my side. Man, what, what one thing do you need to claim as a promise for God or from God in 2018? What is it? Let me just kind of list some promises uh, that I found in Scripture this week. Well, God promises in His Word that He will meet every need you have according to His riches and glory. He promises that you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. God promises to forgive all of your sins. You know, some of you that are here today, if you're hurting from maybe a, a weight of the past, Man, I did this and I feel guilt or I feel ashamed. Guess what? It's forgiven. God will cast it into the sea of forgetfulness and he will remember it no more. God promises to make everything good and bad, and especially the bad. He promises to make everything work together for good to those who love him and those who called according to his purpose. God promises if you feel alone or abandoned that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. God promises to be your ever-present help in the time of need. God promises to be for you, not against you. God promises to give you strength when you're weary. He promises to guide you and give you direction when you're lost. He promises to give you peace that goes beyond any ability to understand. God promises to give you the power to defeat Satan, to overcome the work of the evil one. If you will resist him, he must flee. God promises that nothing will separate you from his love. God promises you that you are more than conquerors through Christ. He promises you that you are an overcomer, that you can overcome the thing that you're facing. Man, for those of you that are here today and you're not walking with God, you have not received Jesus Christ for salvation, man, God promises you eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, we have a countless number of promises from God. And guess what? Scripture tells us that all of them are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. What is the one thing that you need to claim as a promise from God? David knew it. Regardless of my circumstances, I know this I know. This one thing I know, God is on my side. And that's what he claimed. What, what, what are you claiming as a promise from God for your life? Look, I ask you all these questions. What, what one thing do you desire from God? What, what one thing do you lack? What one thing do you need to let go of? What one thing do you, as a promise, do you need to claim from God? Like, I'm asking you all this stuff so that you can begin to think what your one thing would be. What is the one thing that you want different in 2018? so that you can have an incredible impact in your family, in your workplace, in our community, maybe in the world. What, what is the one thing that God is calling you to do? As you begin to focus in on that, I promise you, change is gonna come, but clarity is gonna come as well. And as you begin to seek God, he's gonna continue to respond. He is gonna continue to show and give you direction. And as you have that clarity, I'm gonna just tell you right now, it's gonna be difficult to continue to walk towards that which God gave you. And it does take commitment. But I'm gonna encourage some of you to stay the course, to not waver, to continue on. And as you continue on, I promise you, you will see God move like never before. And when you see God move, I promise you, it will increase the courage in your life. And not only will it increase the courage, I promise you, those of you that kind of have a chaotic life right now, I promise you the chaos will begin to decrease as you focus not only on what it is that God gave you to do, but as you just begin to focus on Jesus.
right? The writer of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12 to fix our eyes on Jesus, right? To focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and now he is sitting down at the right hand of the Father. And we have, we have a God who loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus. And I just believe that 2018 is going to be the best year that you have had yet. Because I honestly be the, believe the best is yet to come. You can call me an optimist if you want. Call me a dreamer if you want. I don't care. I honestly believe that with God, my future only gets brighter and brighter because the same way it is with the kingdom, it only knows increase. And I believe that God has something special for us, all of us, collectively as a body in 2018. Let's pray. Father, I just come before you and I'm just, just even thinking about the things that you want to do in and through our life, in and through this church. And I'm just thankful that you are a God who speaks to your children and that you're speaking even today. You know, right now, just as we're in this attitude of prayer, I, I'm just, just wanting to do this. Will we actually make the commitment today to actually talk over what it is we feel like God's given us with someone? Maybe it's with our spouse. Maybe it's with a close friend. Maybe it's just with other believers and you say, you know what, I, I want to take this seriously. I, I don't want just some good intention. I want a God intention. I want this God-centered thing. And I want to open up my heart and my life. And yes, I have one thing that God wants to do this year, but I want to tell you about it. I'm going to ask you just in a moment, and I pray that you don't make this promise and then go on with life. If you make it, I want you to keep it. But I'm just going to ask how many of you, as you hear from God, as God gives you the one thing, because I believe he's speaking, how many of you would commit to get with other believers, other people, your family, your spouse, whoever it is, and you would talk it over, that you would seek God and you would begin to apply the one thing in your life. If you would if you would choose to do that, would you just lift your hand right now in the place, in this place? God, thank you for people who are not satisfied for, for what was or what is, but are hungry for what could be. God, I ask that, that your Holy Spirit would just move. I pray that that one or two of these questions would just linger in our heart, God, that, that when we would uh, when we would use them to just narrow down to one specific thing that would be different in our life in 2018. Not a good idea, but a God idea. That God, we would truly not just seek the change, but we would seek you, the God of the change. We would seek your kingdom first, your righteousness, and everything else would just be added. God, I pray that you would give us the power when we're weak to give us strength, that you would begin to help us change the one thing, God, for your glory. God, we want to honor you, we want to love you, we want to serve you, and I'm, I'm just believing that you're going to be with us step by step, cheering us on along the way in 2018, and it's in Jesus' name I pray.